shift to the right. You have a COPD patient whose O2 sat is 89, respiratory rate 22, cap refill is under 3 seconds. Asthmatic 56-year-old, INE wheezing, whose respiratory rate is 24, O2 sat 90, or a 43-year-old male patient with right chest tube, subcutaneous emphysema, noted around chest tube insertion site. Why A? Uh, it said they have a left pneumonectomy. We ripped their lung out. Oh, oh so it goes to the right. The yeah. expected yeah. side yeah. effect of yeah. treatment. Yeah. Our trachea yeah. is midline uh -huh. because we have two lungs full of air pressure. When we take one out, the trachea pulls to the side with the air pressure still in it. Expected side effect. Okay, wow. so let's see which one we see then. It's C. C. This asthmatic now I has an e. I and E. I and E means on inspiration and expiration they're wheezing. Look at the respiratory rate. That's above normal. And the O2 sat's only 90, so they are becoming it's acute. Yeah, it's not, it's not expected. Right. When you have a regular asthmatic, you expect them to wheeze either on the exhale or the inhale. Mm -hmm. But when you're, in, when you're wheezing on inhale and exhale, you are all bronchoconstricted. Yes. And the respiratory rate's above normal. Do you see why? Yes. And you're like, oh, I hate these questions. So did I. It took me 38 years to figure them out. Well, I got a few weeks, so. <laughs> Uh, I never had anybody tell me. Oh. All right, and so, and with a chest tube, subcutaneous emphysema is expected. When we put a chest tube in, when the doc sticks it in there, some air comes out under the skin. And you're going to have little rice krispies around the chest tube. Expected. You're going to keep your eye on it. You mark it like you would drainage on a dressing. And you watch it. Keep your eye on it. Keep your eye on it. Because if it gets bigger, now you have an air leak under the skin. Do you understand that one? Yes. All right, we talked about care planning, but I do want to go over assessment. It used to be the NCLEX was entry level nursing. After 2013, it's no longer entry level nursing. Because no new grad listened to their teacher. We always said, go into med surge and get your experience. And all the new grads were going right into ER, SEU, neuro SEU, CCU. So finally, and you know that the Board of Nursing, National Council in Ohio, or in Chicago, they send surveys out. And they say, tell us about your first job. What kind of patients are you taking care of? And if you say, oh, I do ventriculostomy drains and insulin drips, and then uh, and you're, you're talking about, oh, balloon pumps, the board, like, OMG. <laughs> These people are still wet behind the ears. They have no clue what they're doing, and they're taking care of the most acute patients in the hospital. Then when the NCLEX now became no longer entry level. It began, well, you all, you can thank everybody for the past 10 years who went into all these specialty areas. You know, go, go, put a ice pick in their tire, I don't know. But I mean, <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. I do not promote violence. But you want to, look. that's why it got harder. That's why it took that acuity jump. That's why the old test taking strategies don't work no more. That's why the old reviews aren't working no more. So in April, because the rates are so, people are failing so much, so they're decide, did they decide to drop it back in April? Go back nope. Up? Nope. It didn't go back up. It's staying where it's at. Okay. All right. It did not increase in what we call logits. Yeah. Logits is the measure of acuity. Mm -hmm. It's at the same acuity, but they added more natural, homeopathic, alternative yeah. stuff and um, cultural, spiritual stuff. But that you can usually wait. Yeah. <laughs> but the acuity, the acuity. Now what I want to go over, if you get an NCLEX question, will you have to do a respiratory assessment? In what order? What's the first thing you always do for respiratory? We always inspect. What's the next thing? What do you do next? 
We don't auscultate. You're going to palpate, percuss, and then auscultate. That is for respiratory and cardiac assessments. That's the NCLEX answer. Not that you will ever see anybody do it in that order in real life. I will be showing you a respiratory assessment when we go through respiratory stuff. Because you have to know egophony, was perpectoriloquy, tactile mm -hmm. frematis. I know you guys know those. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Taught you those. And um, tactile frematis, diaphragmatic excursion, thoracic expansion, because they put, they want to get rid of two-year RN programs. They only want BSNs. So they put in the BSN physical assessment, of which I have a DVD. They also put in bachelor nutrition information. I know you did not go to dietary school, but they, you, you know if somebody's a renal failure, they have to have low salt, low potassium, and low phosphate. Name me one low phosphate food. Name me a high phosphate food. Go on, I'll be like Cat Williams. Yeah, come on, I'll wait. <laughs> I love Cat. Cat is so funny. He's my altered dark chocolate ego. I was born too white and a woman and too old, but he, he's who I'd like to be if I was black. <laughs> he's funny. He's a good dude. Now, when we, when this is how you're going to answer the NCLEX question. IPA. You will inspect, palpate, percuss, and auscultate. And remember, palpate always comes before percuss because A comes before E in the alphabet. That is your order. When it comes to abdomen, the A moves up. Inspect, auscultate, palpate, percuss. So the A, because you're under abdomen, he got a promotion. That's because if we were to palpate and percuss our abdomen and then listen, we would have increased our bowel sounds because the palpation would have increased peristalsis. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or if your appendix or whatever it is, we, we, we want, first want to be listening to what's going on. So, then we want to, when we're inspecting, we're looking for a common sign which is a bruising around your belly button and is present in 90% of pancreatitis. At 10.30, I will give you a break, okay? We have a lot to do. I have to do all of nursing school this weekend. <laughs> and then some. Now, if it ends up being like last time, I may have to say, because it depends on how much you guys know and how fast you are, Last time I, I added an extra day to it, we may have to do something again next weekend if you can, just so that I do a thorough job. I'm not looking at the time frame, I'm doing that you get it. If I look up and I'm having a stroke and I see you, I'm going to go, it's you. <laughs> not, it's you. <laughs> All right? <laughs> not you. And I don't want, I, and you guys got to learn, you want to have it up here. You don't want to rely on the internet. I can just see I'm having my stroke at Manatee Hospital and say, Oh, Mrs. May, you're going to die. The internet's down. I want it up here. I want it up here. All right, one of the things we're going to discuss, let me see if this blue, those markers are bugging me. They're not showing up, but are they? All right, we talked about vasodilation and the concept of MAP, didn't we? Yes. And we said there are some things that our little blood vessel is worried about <coughs> that makes him vasodilate. One of those things was CO2, acid. One of those things is magnesium. And one of those things is in sepsis, we have bacteria, little bacteria, that are crapping in your blood. That is called endotoxins and exotoxins. That is bacterial poo. If you were yeah, in a blood, if you were a blood vessel and you were be treated, you know, little aren't bacteria little animals? They have to eat, they have to crap. The crap is endotoxins and exotoxins. It's pus in your blood. So now here you are, you're a nice little blood vessel, 
How, what would you do if you were being treated like a sewer and you had crap all in you? Ah, 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 you want to get away from it. Just like with CO2s and acid. Ah, ah, ah. And we're going to go over why magnesium does it. How are you guys all your electrolytes? Electrolytes is not just knowing your normal serum values. Electrolytes are the basics of pharmacology. Every single movement, unfortunately most nursing schools only teach ele um, electrolytes and depolarization during cardiac. Like that's the only muscle that depolarizes. My husband will tell you, I'm from New York, my, muscle de my mouth depolarizes very rapidly. <laughs> and he knows that. Every movement is depolarization. Those electrolytes are playing musical chairs of electricity to depolarize your muscles. So that's why you have calcium channel blockers to slow down your heart rate and vasodilate. That's why you have sodium channel blockers like dilatin. That's where you have potassium channel blockers like amiodarone. I mean, let's discuss some depolarization. Potassium lives largely intracellular. The serum potassium you measure, 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per deciliter, is just the extra that he needs to suck the, ser suck the extra inside the, the cell. We have no idea how much potassium is really in our body. We have no clue how much is intracellular because we can't measure it. But that's where he likes to live, and he likes to live in there alone. And he's got calcium out here, two positive charges, sodium, chloride, mag, and phosphate. What's your normal phosphate level? 2.5 to 4.5. What's your normal chloride level? 96 to 105. Yeah, right around 90, 95 to 105, 98 to 108, right around in there. Every hospital has a different one. What about your potassium in serum? 3.5 to 5. I always think 3.5 to 5 bananas a day because bananas are rich in potassium. Phosphate is negatively charged. Mag is positive. What's your normal mag level? 1.5 to 2.5. Yeah, or 1.7 to 2.2, right around there. I always remember my mag level is right about 2. And when you were a kid, did you ever play with two magnets? Mm -hmm. And you, they would, they'd stuck together, then you turned them around and they repelled each other? Normal mag level, magnets, is 2. And your two ventricles in your heart, the mag. If you have low mag, you're throwing PVCs. We'll be doing that when we get to cardio. Sodium level. One thirty-five to one forty-five. I always like take a salt shaker. Psh, looks like one hundred forty-five grains of me. All right. Calcium. Eight to ten and a half. Eight and a half to ten. I always think about eight to ten cows in the pasture. It's a small pasture. All right? Now, every cell, he's negatively charged on the inside and positive on the outside when he's resting. You guys remember this from AMP? Look at all these positive charges out here. We are nothing but electricity. I also am a Reiki practitioner and a massage therapist. I do a lot with alternative medicine. We are all one big encased pool of electricity, aren't we? We measure the electricity in the EKG, in the EEG. We also have always used, the military's always used the aura. Has always used the aura to pick up on night vision scopes. What do you think they are? Night vision scope pick up on body heat. Where's your heat come from? Your Krebs cycle, the cycle of AMP and ATP. When you rip apart those phosphate bonds, you get mini nuclear explosions and you get energy. We pick up on that. We pick up on that energy. Heat, if E equals MC squared, energy takes different form. Just like water turns to ice, turns to snow, has the same chemical, it's just in a different form. So we use energy a lot. Have you ever been around somebody who sucks the life out of you? Mm. I call them energy vampires. They do nothing but whine and moan and whine and moan. You know, I don't whine and moan. You want to know why? Because I was supposed to die. And my husband was in Desert Storm in 91. 
And a Mack truck, I, had, I brought my kids up from Virginia while he was stationed in the Gulf of Aqaba on the USS Mississippi to have mom watch the three kids in Pennsylvania while I went to go finish up my bachelor's degree. In 91, I wanted my bachelor's done. Mack truck on black ice hit me head on. I broke C2. Got the halo scars to prove it. L4 and 5, ripped my ear off, ripped my scalp off 30 stitches, broke all my ribs, my collarbone. I got a couple into medullary rods holding my arm together. I was supposed to die, be paralyzed. They were going to cut my arm off because I would never get function back again. That's why you never listen to your doctor. Um, they told me that uh, they brought my husband home from Desert Storm for my funeral because we had three little kids, six, four, and two. Obviously, I fooled the Navy and lived. Um, <laughs> And I have no arthritis and I have no issues because I do everything naturally with turmeric and papaya and raw ginger root for anti-inflammatories. I don't do ibuprofen. I'm not on any medications. Nothing. But one thing that, that taught me, no day's ever as bad as the day you're told you're going to die. No day is ever as bad as when you're told you never see your three kids grow up and now I got five grandkids. So when I'm in the airport, like, I will be going to Henry Ford Community College in two weeks, and somebody will be going ballistic. Oh, he cut in front of me, and I have a plane. And I said, well, I fly almost every week. I, there's another plane going there. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee you miss it, you'll catch the next one. Yeah. And they sit there, and they're like, well, he shouldn't be in front of me. I'm like, is this? And I know they don't have a gun because we're going through security, right? And I say, is this really the worst thing that's ever happened to you? <laughs> Let me tell you about my bad day. I'm a nurse. Let me tell you about my worst day, and I tell them that story. I said, so it's all relative. It's really all relative. You need to think about what your worst day is in your life. I guarantee this moment ain't it. No, no. Shut up, you bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then usually, 90% of the time, because I like to spread sunshine wherever I go, um, I'm annoyingly happy. It just burp, burps people. Um, they turn around and say, you know, I'm sorry, you're right. My sister actually had an accident oh, like that when she died. Then that's your worst day. This ain't it. Don't let that negative energy permeate you and take over. You make a decision every day. How many whiny, witchy nurses do you hear on the floor? Oh, Nursing comes from the root word to nurture. You're supposed to be loving, caring, happy, kind. And when somebody's mean to me in the hospital, I don't have a lot of friends when I'm working. Because A, I don't listen to gossip. B, I'm very successful, and you know they hate that. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy. You know they hate that more. Yes. <laughs> and my record between St. Anthony's Hospital and Largo Medical Center was 20 12-hour night shifts in a row in 2008, right before I started ITT. So I'm not one of those nurses who hasn't touched a patient in a long time, and I'm still PRN, home care, ICU, and ER. Just, you know, got to keep the license. Now, I want you guys to know your nursing comes from nurturing and caring, and I'm really irked we are losing that. Yes. And do you know what is the number one thing in lawsuits, why people sue, when I'm doing a lawsuit mm -hmm. with a lawyer? And I say, why are you suing? Really one thing, I heard the nurses talking. 90% of all lawsuits happen because some stupid nurse ran their mouth complaining about short staff, short complaining about something, and then the person feels they're not getting the care they deserve. And when you're mean or snitty, or they hear about the three guys you banged on Friday night, they form an opinion. And they think, well, that's not how a short nurse should be. I'm going to get her or him. So then no matter what you do, they are gunning for you. Do you know I've been in nursing 38 years and I have never been sued? <laughs> I've been, re this is wood, my husband built it, I know it's wood. Mm -hmm. um, but that's because I'm nice. I've made mistakes. I write myself up, I tell my manager and I go in and I tell the patient, I gave you double the quantity, I am now off shift. I'm not going home, I'm sitting with you, I'm going to take your blood pressure every hour. And make sure you're all right. And, this, and the wife will go, 
He's fine, Diana. Go home. No, it's not fair to make the other nurses come in here, Johnny, every hour, doing vital signs or every half hour, because I made a mistake and gave too much blood pressure medicine. I'm going to stay, so what do you want to watch? I like Big Ben. Uh -huh. And then they see you go in the extra yard. They know people make mistakes. They're human. Uh -huh. It's when you lie, gossip, and you try to cover it up. They will sue you. Yeah. But if you own up to it and say, I don't know how, I moved a decimal point, couldn't remember, did I move it to the right, did I move it to the left, <laughs> I, I, I messed up. But I'm not leaving you until you're better. And they love that. And you've written yourself up, you've taken accountability, and you owned it. How many people do you know when they make a mistake? Lie. Oh my yes. <laughs> Should nurses lie? No. Aren't we supposed to be ethical? Yeah. Yes. Do you know in surveys, nursing is the most respected profession out there? Even though, well, A, above Catholic priests. And no. we are above school bus drivers now. It used to be the school bus driver was they trusted like a nurse, but not no more. <laughs> they, they've been in the news too much. So, <laughs> driving drunk, road rage with your kiddies on board, they don't do it anymore. So when it comes to nursing, when it comes to being sued, protect, you're going you're to get your license. To protect it, be nice. When I've been removed from three lawsuits in my career, about every seven to ten years, one will pop up, statistically. And they say they're suing the hospital, the doctor, every nurse. Oh, but not Diana. She was the only one who took the time to teach and explain and was so nice. No, no, remove her. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's because I, I've never carried malpractice insurance, even as a nurse practitioner. Never, not once, no, never. I don't need it. My mom always taught me to be nice. Even when people are mean to me on the floor, I will double time be in your room helping you. You're having a bad day. And your patients need to see somebody who's smiling and happy. And I have one nurse screaming at me. What is wrong with you? Why are you always in my room? I said, well, you seem like you're in a bad mood. Maybe you need a little help. Diana, I don't like you. Are you stupid? No, it's not about liking me. I figure your patients need to see somebody who's happy today. It's not personal. I'm here to help take care of the patients. And the nicer you are, the more angry you may get. Yes. That's in the Bible. The Bible says it heats fiery coals on their head. Right. When you're nice, you don't react. We're too reactionary. Road rage. All right? <laughs> so if you really, you're going to get this license, I promise you. But you've got to change. Mm. When I've gone through a divorce, I've gone through Stace Tracy, my best friend in CCU. I hope she buys the video. All right? <laughs> Sleeping with my man. Had to work with her every day. Morning, Trace. <laughs> Did I want to run her over in the parking lot? Absolutely. Did I say one word about it at work? Never. If she took my mail in a rental property, am I going to give her my dignity and my license? And my job? No, he was back in six weeks, but <laughs> done. <laughs> but you know how nurses love drama. Look at all the reality shows on TV. Nurses shouldn't be that way. Also, nursing is built on the premise that we are supposed to restore the person back to independence. So on your NCLEX, doing it for the patient is never the answer. Ever. They test you on our philosophy, how what we were built in. We were built on you're supposed to do everything to help the patient get back to being independent. How many times, though, if somebody's doing something wrong, the nurse says, oh, just let me do it. Mm -hmm. Now, but that's because it's faster, not because it's the nursing way. So on NCLEX, if you, they give you a question that someone is doing their AccuCheck wrong, doing their eye drops wrong, doing their ear drops wrong, and it says, your priority nursing intervention is to, is it to demonstrate correct procedure, teach a family member correct procedure, is it to review the correct steps in the procedure? Ding, ding, ding. Yes. <laughs> uh, your answer is always to reteach and review the steps so that they can do it. It is never to do it for the patient. 
because your philosophy of nursing, what we were founded on, is to help people get better and independent. Yes. So never, ever, ever. We're going to take a little break right now, 15 minutes, all right?